and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we begin our reading of Henrietta's War by Joyce Dennis. This is a collection of letters from an imaginary lady to her imaginary friend who is a British officer in France during World War II. So these are letters from the home front during World War II. And they were designed, they were originally published in a magazine, and they were designed to help keep up morale, as was extremely important then. Here is the author's introduction. I never do spring cleaning. I know I should, and every year am filled with a longing to do better and rush round the house, emptying drawers and shelves onto the floor and unearthing many treasures, such as my dark glasses, mourned as lost, and endless snapshots. After enjoying several holidays in retrospect, I somehow lose heart and bundle everything back again. But this year, I was rewarded for my good intentions by discovering a bundle of pieces I had written during the war for the Sketch magazine. The cuttings were anything but tidy, the margins thick with arrows, stars, and balloons, but they were still readable, and it was enthralling to be reminded of the privations and discomforts suffered by those living in what the authority is pleased to call a safe area. It made fascinating reading. Did we really do those peculiar things? I said to my friend Felicity, who had dropped in and was reading over my shoulder. We certainly did, she said. Did we really parade the streets at night wearing tin hats? Of course we did, said Felicity. Look here, Joyce, I've got a daughter who is in publishing. Why don't you send these things to her? She won't mind the balloons. And that's exactly what I did. Devon, 1985. October 18th, 1939. My dear Robert, it was good to get your letter and to hear that you are in a perfectly safe place, though I wonder how much of that is true and how much is intended to allay, allay the alarms of your childhood's friend. And why, when I and everybody else know that you are in France, must I address my letters to Berkshire? Well, well, I suppose they know best, and ours is not to reason why, but I seem to remember that when I wrote to you in the last war, I used to put BEF, British Expeditionary Force, France, quite boldly on the envelope, thereby, no doubt, endangering the safety of the British Empire. I think there is a tendency in our generation to adopt a superior know-all attitude toward this war just because we happen to have been through the last one, which the young must find maddening. Charles and I fight against it, not always successfully, I'm afraid. Lady B was here yesterday. Her view of the, ah, my dears, this is all very different from the last dear old war brigade is bracing, to say the least. I saw Bill and Linnet exchange a satisfied look as she leaned further and further forward in her excitement. Bill is waiting for a promotion, and Linnet is going into hospital as a probationer. I won't write any more about them now, or this letter will fail as a message of cheer for a middle-aged colonel on the Western Front. Next week, I shall be able to write about them more calmly. One gets used to anything in time. Here we go on much as usual, and one feels faintly ashamed of being in such a safe area. Charles says, how do you know it is a safe area? And of course we don't. We don't know much about anything yet. But in the meantime, we have been told it is a safe area, and one is thankful not to have to start being frightened before one need. Freddie writes that in London, everybody's ears are growing straight out of their heads with listening. I feel this letter will not be complete without a word about our refugees. The day they were due to arrive, Charles and I had to go to a funeral at the other end of the county, which incidentally did nothing to raise our drooping spirits, but we left the linnet in charge with instructions that when the little fellow arrived, she was to examine his head. Charles, suggested, uh, Charles suggested this. Doctors are inclined to look on the sordid side of life, aren't they? Give him a nice hot bath, an egg for his supper, tuck him up in bed, and write a heartening letter to his mother. The linnet, who had not been head girl at school for nothing, took these duties seriously, even going so far as to lay a bar of chocolate on the lonely pillow and fish her old teddy bear out of a box in the attic. At half past five, a youth of 16, just under six feet tall, was deposited on our doorstep. Linnet said she'd just managed to get the teddy bear out in time. He ate the chocolate. His name is Bertram, and we have the whole technical school billeted in the village. 
all such nice boys, but you can't feed them on ten shillings a week. At least, I suppose you could, but it wouldn't be quite kind. How eminently sensible is Mrs. Weinbite, who has taken in all her rich relations as paying guests, thus, in the words of J. M. Barry, turning her necessity to glorious gain. My dear Robert, I have a great urge to knit something for you. I suppose you are overrun, or rather overwrapped, with scarves. Do you remember the scarf I knitted you in the last war? Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. November 1st, 1939. My dear Robert, it is really very nice to get letters from you saying you are well, comfortable, safe, and having French lessons from a beautiful countess, though it sounds rather too much like the lull before the storm. Charles says you are having a good war, and would you like to change places with him? Poor Charles. He does hate the idea of being stuck down here for the duration, saying there, there to old ladies, and still lives in hopes of being called up. Colonel Simpkins said to him yesterday, What? You still here? I thought you got a DSO in the last war. Charles blinked at him through his spectacles and said gently, Ah, but you see, I'm too frightened to go to this one. So we are expecting a shower of white feathers by every post. This is a belligerent community to make up for the extreme peacefulness of our surroundings, I suppose. Yesterday it was a lovely sunny afternoon, and I took Perry for a walk up the cliff path. Young Whittacombe was painting his fishing boat, and there were old ladies on seats, and a great many gloriously healthy, tough-looking babies in prams. All babies nowadays give you the impression that for tuppence they'd biff you one on the nose. Is this the result of modern methods, or have they always been like this? At the top of the cliff, I had a long, earnest, nose-to-nose -nose conversation with Mrs. Savernack about the Women's Institute Choir, and on the links there was a man having a lesson from the pro to cure a nasty slice in his drive, and the sea was very quiet and still, just whispering on the pebbles, and as I walked home, the evening lights on the water to the west were pearly, so that I had to keep turning round to look at them. I began to wonder whether I might not be suffering from some horrid hallucination, until I saw our gas masks on the hall table. But in the matter of trousers, dear Robert, the war has hit us hard. Nobody can live in a seaside town without becoming more or less slack-minded. Our female visitors every summer adopt such a nautical air one expects them to break into sea shanties at any minute. But now, such as Hitler's power, this evil influence has begun to affect even the residents, and it keeps breaking out in the most unlikely quarters. Miss Piper, the girl in the greengrocers, has gone into jodhpurs. Faith, our friend, looks quite superb in a pair of pinstripe flannels. Mrs. Savernack, though I can hardly expect you to believe this, saw fit to appear last week in a pair of khaki shorts. We all consider her excuse that she is digging her way to victory a poor one. I tell you frankly, Robert, only my love for Charles has kept me out of a pair of green corduroy dungarees. The linnet, who looks handsome in her nurse's uniform, has gone to her hospital. She writes cheerfully and says she is enjoying it so far, but oh, her poor feet. Bill assures us that he will shortly be a real soldier. I heard from Betsy last week. Her world has come tumbling about her ears if anybody's has, but she writes with her usual spirit to say that she is now living in the depths of the country, listening to her arteries harden. She says she wears brogues and talks with a burr, and sometimes she wears burrs and talks with a brogue just to make a change. Dear Robert, our thoughts are often with you, and if I write of everyday things, it is only because I know that they are what you would rather hear about. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. November 15, 1939. My dear Robert, our lovely sunny autumn days have gone, and now we have cold rain and a tearing, roaring wind. Well, let's face it, winter is in front of us now, and it will be as cold and wet, dark and cheerless as it has always been. But this winter, we country people will, try, will have to try not to grumble about the weather as much as we usually do, if only for the sakes of what the papers call the town dwellers in our midst. They, poor dears, are not used to turning a corner and being blown flat on their faces by a southwest gale, or running round with towels to mop up the rain, and they are going to take it hard. I am sure they will need all the sympathy and encouragement we yokels can give them. 
Already, it is quite pathetic to witness their dismay at the prospect of a long winter spent in darkest Devon. What do you do in a place like this, they wail, as they struggle back in their neat court shoes to the small furnished houses, every modern convenience, which they have rented for the duration of the war. And this is where we bite back the stinging reply that there is a good lending library in the middle of the street and an equally good wool shop next door, and say tenderly that we have a bridge club as well as a badminton club, that the Dramatic Society and the Women's Institute Choir would both welcome them if they were interested in that sort of thing, and that the cinema is now open every day instead of only three times a week, and would they care to drop in on Sunday morning after church for some sherry and meet some people? They generally sample most of the entertainments we offer them, and I am sure they get a lot of fun out of them. You can almost see them at the choir practices composing funny letters to their husbands about the quaint lives we lead down here. But I am told that after an afternoon among our tigers at the bridge club, they grope their way home with dazed expressions on their faces. Some of them fling themselves into the life of the place in a most astonishing manner. At the end of a fortnight, they know more of what is going on than Charles and I do, and one or two of them have told us some really remarkable things about the lives of our fishermen. Charles says he's afraid the fishermen aren't always absolutely truthful. We have had a great ARP activity in this part of the world lately. Of course, it rained, but in spite of that, a good time was had by all, especially the fire engine. I couldn't help feeling sorry for all of the pretend casualties who lay about in the gutters uncomplainingly until they were picked up. Charles, returning late in the evening, nearly ran over a figure lying on the side of the road. Hello, he said, what's the matter with you? And a cheerful voice replied out of the darkness, I've got all my bones broken. Muriel is now a captain in the ATS. I do envy her. There's not much glamour on the home front. Ours, not the saucy peaked caps of our untrammeled sisters. Ours, rather, to see that the curtains are properly drawn and do our little bit of digging in the garden. Ours to brave the sewing party and painstakingly make a many-tailed bandage, and ours to fetch the groceries home in a big basket. Soon we shall have the big thrill of ration cards to add to these other excitements, and all in a, recep and all in a reception area, too. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. November 29th, 1939. My dear Robert, last week I took my courage in both hands and went to the Sister Susie sewing bee. I have been meaning to go for a long time, but I've never been able to summon the courage. When I got to the door, panic seized me and I nearly fled. But then I remembered all that you brave boys are doing at the front, and I took a big breath and turned the handle. Who are these like nuns appearing? About fifty beautiful women, all in snowy white, are seated at three long tables, all, as they say, plying their needles. Can that be my old friend Faith, needle poised in air and a demure expression on her face? Surely, surely, the Madonna at the sewing machine cannot possibly be Mrs. Savernack, the terror of the bridge club. What is there about a white veil tied neatly round the head that can effect this transformation? Should women conceal their hair? Is it a betrayal rather than a crowning glory? These thoughts surge madly through my head as I stand at the door with my mouth open. The nuns look up and then bend to their work again. I am a novice and must be made to feel it. Meekly, I approach the high table, murmuring, I've come to sew and I've brought my own thimble and cotton. I hope that this miracle of forethought will commend me to authority, but the mother superior is unmoved. Have you brought your white coat and veil, she says. I'm afraid I haven't. You'll have to go out and buy them, she says kindly. You can get some quite inexpensively at Dobson's. Ears red with shame, I creep out and buy a white coat and veil inexpensively at Dobson's. Then there's the horror of getting in all over again, but this time I pause to put on my armor. The looking glass in the lady's cloak is small and spotty, but even so, I can see that I am the only woman in the world who is not improved by a white veil tied round the head, and it is with almost as much trepidation as before that I make my second entrance. But this time, all is changed. I have taken my vows, and the nuns smile a welcome. 
several wave, and one kisses her hand. Greatly encouraged, I approach the high table once more and am given a piece of flannel to make into a hot water bottle cover. Now, nobody enjoys a bit of herring boning more than I, and the flannel is of a heavenly blue, so I am quite delighted with my task. But why the veil? Why the white coat? Am I dirtier than the feet of the British Expeditionary Force? Fancy you being able to sew, says one of the nuns, making room for me beside her at the table. Yes, and I can read and write as well, I say. This is the sort of joke that Charles says he wishes I wouldn't make. My neighbor is engaged upon a complicated piece of work and is executing it with proficiency. What are you making? I ask with respect, deeply conscious of my novice's task. A helpless case nightshirt, she says briskly. I look round. The nuns are bending over their work, the low, and the low buzz of demure chatter fills the room. Helpless case nightshirts, swabs and many-tailed bandages, young bodies maimed and broken, and dark hours of pain and despair watching for morning to lighten the windows. It doesn't do to think too much these days, even at a B. But agonizing doesn't sow a seam, and salt tears on hospital supplies would be far from aseptic. I look at the wise and busy nuns and thread my needle. This simple action is watched intently by my neighbors. I know several things about sewing bees now, Robert, which I never knew before, and one is that all sewers are divided into sheep and goats. The goats are the ones whose thread comes off pink when the tip is licked. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. And we'll hear more from Henrietta next time. <laughs>